Squirrel. <laughs> hey y'all. Hey Spencer. We're swapped Whoa. around. Again. Huh? We're swapped around again. Yep, yeah, I know you do it on purpose. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, sorry, clicking through this stuff so I can get back to the comments. Moderators, thank you very much before we even get going. And before anybody says anything, uh, yes, we're a few minutes late. That's because Greg was asking a really interesting line of questions to Al, our guest. And Misty is here, so it's not my fault. But anyway. How many we got in here with us today? <laughs> uh, I guess 27 right now. So uh, it, it'll it pick up. It'll pick up. Oh, House, yeah. everybody wants to know how you're doing. How's your leg? It's still with me. They uh, Surgery went well, according to the surgeon. I went back Friday, which the surgery was the Thursday before. And so that was eight days after I went back last Friday. Surgeon gave me a real great report. My foot looked really good. Uh, said that all the components went in there well. Everything fit up. So now I've got a big block about that big, solid titanium. And I've got a rod that's like 17, 18 inches. It goes through my heel bone, through that block, and all the way up into my leg bone. And then he threw in a four or five different screws for good measure. Oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm going to be like the titanium man there'll be no going through uh metal detectors for me and sneaking in uh but he did give me the sad news was no weight on it for six weeks so that means that everybody that comes to the lbl i'm gonna be the dude on the crutches or rolling around in the sporty wheelchair so that's okay too <laughs> that's okay hey, whatever it if, 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 no yeah i mean that well whatever it takes for you to heal up if you're still all crippled up at the meet and greet and everything, if you get mouthy like you did backstage there just a minute ago, I'll be able to shove you down a hill without any <laughs> resistance. No doubt. Hey, Spencer will put a, he put a wheel chalk on my wheelchair. He shoved me down to the water and put me in the mud, and I'll just be down there stranded. But, yeah, lots of pain. The pain has got better in the last two days. Good. I went from having to – I was eating the pain pill like every two hours, like eating Skittles. Till I had uh, two yesterday. I mean, I went from one every two hours to two in one day. Was that because, now, you and I had talked about it, but they had to drill into your hip to get the bone marrow stuff, and that's yeah. what was really hurting you, not even the ankle thing. But whenever yeah. you went back to the doctor and they took that off, did it relieve a oh, lot it of pain? Helped. It helped a lot. Friday was a glorious day because that titanium chunk that they put in my ankle, they had to have bone marrow to pack. The, that thing had like honeycomb holes in it. And the surgeon had to pack that with bone pieces and bone marrow, which I was the donator. And he went into the top of my hip. He went into the, actually not the top of the hip, but the top of the femur where it goes to your hip. And he drilled undoubtedly a big gaping hole. Yes. Rotor rotor down in there and drug out a bunch of bone marrow. And he packed it and put it in there. And y'all, that's been my pain. Honest to God, my ankle, from my knee down, the pain level since the surgery, the worst on a scale of one to 10 was about a three. It's been staying like a one to a two. And like matter of fact, right now, I have no pain in it at all this second. But my hip, from my knee all the way to the top of my hip, that entire femur bone, scale of one to 10 was about a 28. I mean, it, I thought I was going to lose my mind. It was hurting so bad. There was a couple of times I thought I was going to have to get Wanda to take me to the emergency room. I mean, I, I was to the brink of it wasn't good. So, and my hip looks like I've been hit by a car. 
I mean, it I, massive bruise. Uh, either that or one that was kicking me in my sleep. I'm not sure. So, <laughs> well, I know when I talked to you, it was bad. I could hear it in your voice that you yeah. was just, you was miserable. Yes. Oh yeah, there was. Yeah. A- I'd had to get this couple of days. I'd had to get better to die. That there was a few days I was I was concerned well, just with your pain. Better. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad that everything worked out well and you're on the mend. Even if it does take six weeks, that ain't nothing in the grand scheme of things. Nah, I'll be all right. Like I said, I'll just be, I won't be able to probably roll to everybody's camps out there. He's going to to walk up there and see me. And squirrel. All right, too. Y'all were sick and everything. Everybody good at your place now? Yeah, everybody's feeling a lot. I, my internet's cutting out really bad. Like, there's a huge delay. I'm sorry. But, yeah, everybody's feeling better. But okay. now you got sick ones. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, my girls are sick. You want to talk about something weird? They said it was a bacterial version of the flu. I've never heard of that in my life. We looked it up, though. It's a real thing. But anyway, it's taken them a long time to get over it. And then both of them, God bless them, because they were sick with that. They got one of them got an ear infection. One of them got a sinus infection. And I think they're over the bacterial flu thing. But they're on high dose antibiotics getting over the uh, the infections. But they just don't feel good. By the way, y'all, just so you know, if I have to jump off here. If my daughters are like not happy and not feeling good, I'm a bounce. But anyway, it just is what it is right now. Well, one more one more thing, right quick. Let me go ahead and throw this out there right now. I want to express my total gratitude to all these people. They have called, they have texted, they have sent me messages. Just everybody telling me I was in their thoughts and prayers, and y'all do not have any clue. How much that meant to me. That's very humbling, ain't it? I know what prayers can do. And y'all just having that many people that's reached out to me and expressed their concern. Y'all, I overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. Look at that. There's Obama. I I, I sent (laughs) Obama a text. I sent Obama a text the other morning. I was worried about him. He he's over asleep with his phone off and with the tornado. Under a tornado warning, I'm oh, like, wow. I don't know if you're paying attention, but uh, y'all about to get blown away. And then, he, <laughs> then he sent me a message like three hours later. He's like, well, I, I had my phone off, so I can't. <laughs> the grace of the good Lord kept him from getting like Dorothy and Toto flowed him and, you know, him and his Bama. dog and like Toto. Bama don't care. Have you ever met Bama? Bama don't care. Yeah. Bama goes out in camps where he knows boogers are like a lot of us, although Bama, turn your phone off in the middle of like uh, predicted tornadoes. That's probably not the smartest move. But mm-hmm. he said, uh, <laughs> Bama and Mark Newbill going to be on next week, and we're going to go over all the stuff about uh, past meet and greets and uh, what's coming up. But anyway, we got to get to Al, who's just yeah. hanging out backstage. Everybody in chat, I'm thank you very much. Yep. Misty lined up this one. Misty lined up Al. So we, Misty's we got a lot questions. of stuff in common. I'm I'm excited to get to talk to this man. <laughs> Misty, Misty's going to do all the questions on this one. She's going to talk the whole time. Here we go. Yeah, right. <laughs> hey. Al, how you doing, brother? How you doing, folks? How you doing? Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Misty, for reaching out to me. Uh, it's my honor to be here. Spence, Greg, hey. everybody. Glad no, we're, we're happy to have you, man. Thank you for coming on. Yep. So we'll get right in it. Al, how the hell did you get into the crazy Bigfoot paranormal world? Just like start from the beginning, act like nobody's ever heard your stuff before and walk us through it, man. Okay, my mom was a psychic, and, uh, you know, er she would always have, like, experiences whenever somebody died. 
they would always come to her first. And uh, didn't matter if she was in New York, Florida, or Italy. If someone died, they came to my mother. Uh, my brother is the first parasite, one of the first parapsychologists in the United States. He worked with Han Holzer's right hand man. Hans Holzer's was a very famous ghost ghost guy and uh, and their psychic Ethel. And my sister's intuitive. Uh, my whole family paranormal was normal in my family. We had a, we had two white witches. We had a black witch, um, and uh, grew wait, up with. Wait. What does that mean? What is what is two white witches and a black witch? Is it like two people that are good and one that's bad? Yeah, two two of them pra pra practice white white witchcraft, and one was more on the darker side. Yeah. She was on the darker side and uh, my cousin, she was, you know, she was doing stuff she shouldn't have been doing, playing with things she shouldn't have been playing with. And um, plus of that, she died early. She died young. But um, so, you know, like I said, growing up in my house, the paranormal was normal. Like I said, when I was five years old, um, my grandmother who lived with us passed away and the funeral parlor was across the street from our house. And I got her bed. I slept in her bed with her sheets and her pillows. And she came to me for like a week straight and would tuck me in. And I would tell my mother, you know, you know, grandma's here. I get an Italian. Grandma's here. She's sucking me in. And my mother would say, yeah, don't worry about it. She's just making sure you're okay. But I knew that she was across the street at the funeral parlor. You know what I mean? Um, five, that was at five. At 10, I see my first UFO. At 12, I had my first Bigfoot experience. So, like I said, the paranormal was normal in my family. It, it, we could spend two shows talking about from the time you were 5 to 12. <laughs> <laughs> Probably <laughs> one of that, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. No, I mean, so, you know, like when I was getting older and I was hanging out with my friends and talking about, like, my my uncles and my aunts that would do seances and stuff like that and, me and my cousins would sneak out to watch what they were doing. And and they didn't, never had any Ouija boards, but they played with tarot cards a lot. And, you know, you'd see the flames on the candelabra going up and down and this and that. It was wild stuff, you know. And, uh, of course, whenever they seen us, they would kick our butts and send us back into the bedroom. But that never stopped us. We always came back out to watch them more, you know. But, um <laughs> You know, so when I told my friends that and growing up in the neighborhood, they were looking at me like I was crazy. Like, dude, that's not normal. You know, I was like, well, <laughs> it is in my house. Mm. You like you like sneak out of bed at 11 o'clock at night and people are like sacrificing small, fluffy mammals. <laughs> no, 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 there was no <laughs> sacrificing going on. But we would, me and my cousins, we would sneak out, crawl down the hallway and like hiding in the shadows and peek around the corner and they'd have tarot cards out or they'd be all holding hands connected. And they were always trying to reach like a dead relative or somebody or trying to get an answer to something that, no, you know, some kind of question that they had about the family that whoever died took the secret with them. You know what I mean? It was always something along those lines and we would be, we would be, and, but, um, but to see like, I never, I haven't seen a candelabra dance like that until maybe three years ago. I was on an investigation and we were at, and, and the candelabra actually danced that. And, and so that's how far and few between you see stuff like that happen. You know what I mean? It doesn't happen all the time. Well, just so I understand clearly where we're coming from, if this was happening in your family while you were growing up, is this something that was like specific to your family? Is this a regional thing? I don't mean to be insensitive, but like, like where does, where does your people come from? My, well, my father, exact same way. my father's family, uh, original is an original family of Rome, Rome, Italy. And my mother came from the North Italy and uh, a uh, place called Palmer. Palma, Italy, up north. So there were two different regions. But um, I guess it's just like old world, old world, you know, 
knowledge. You know what I mean? Like I've had a couple of girlfriends over the years put the evil eye on me. And I would have to go to my aunt to have it taken off because I just knew it was too much bad luck going on. Said somebody, someone gave me a curse, you know, cursed me, and uh, she would take it off, and then, boop, you would feel like different, and all of a sudden your luck would change, you know. So my father didn't believe in any of it, but he had he had a ghost run through the engine block of his '65 Mustang look right into the window, go like this and go out into the bay. And my, yeah. the guy he was with, who was a tank commander in world war II, my father was an, uh, an Alpine Ranger. His buddy was like, okay, let's go. Let's get out of here. And my father's like, not until I go back to the dock and get all my fishing equipment because, uh, and if they told that story, my father, swore it never happened but if this guy angelo would have been was at the house and i'd say hey Ange, tell that story about when you guys were fishing and i told that story angelo would get goosebumps and he would get tears would come in his eyes because it freaked him out so much and you know these are guys who were who got like um you know uh what do you call those uh those uh, what do you call it when you get a, a purple hearts in world war ii you know they both had multiple purple hearts in world war ii so they weren't afraid of death or stuff like that but like my father just you couldn't like he didn't want to hear about it he was in denial and that was the end of it as a matter of fact my mother talked so much in her sleep because that's when people would come to her that he would make her go sleep in another room because he used to have to get up at five o'clock in the morning to go work construction. And he said, I need my sleep. And all you do is talk all night long. But my mother doesn't realize it. You know, people are coming to her in her sleep and she's having these full blown conversations, but she doesn't realize it, you know? Uh, Squirrel, what were you saying about your yes. family? And second, and second, you're going to have to talk to Al through this whole thing because we're dealing with stuff way outside my experience here. I'm going to listen. Well, no, I, I was just saying that we grew up doing the same thing. Like I remember coming in over at, you know, Mama's house and several of the ladies in the family all sitting around a table playing the Ouija board or just, you know, different random things like that. But, you know, it, it's, it wasn't like it was daily, but it was fairly regular that we kind of, and I've seen the candles dance just like he was talking about. You look stunned. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have You've got lots of words. <laughs> I have nothing to add to this conversation. I'm still trying to figure <laughs> out if, y'all, if, if I all had Spencer like starstruck about all the stuff that was happening. Or Spencer couldn't grasp his hands around the fact that there were multiple people in that family that stayed up past 11 p.m. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, Greg, Greg is in rare form today, y'all. It's the pain pills. <laughs> no doubt. Yes. I played the fifth. Mm. So, I always played the fifth. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So, Al. You grew up in this kind of environment and everything. You had all this kind of stuff happen that has to open your mind to a lot of what's out there and everything. Now, you on other shows, your bio, everything that you've had happen and everything. What was your first experience that was going into the whole, like, I don't care what you talk about, cryptids boogers, aliens, whatever. But like, what was the first real thing that happened to you that opened your eyes to, holy cow, this is real. Or maybe you already felt that way, but like, give us something on one of your first experiences that was really eye-opening. Well, I think, I think the first one that, you know, I was old enough to really comprehend what was going on. Like when my grandmother came to me at five, I really didn't know. I mean, I knew she was dead and I knew my mother would tell, like my, I couldn't tell it to my father because he'd, he'd kick my ass, you know? Um, but my mother would say, yeah, don't worry. But when I was like 10, 
buddy of mine, me and my best friend, Rich, were, we were sky watchers. We're sitting on an A-frame roof. My father had an A-frame roof on his garage, and he had like a grapevine that went over it. So we're up on the A-frame roof just listening to rock and roll, listen, watching the air traffic on the sky, sky watching, and we seen like these points of light dancing up in the sky, way up in the sky. It looked like stars. And I had this brilliant idea. I said, watch this, Rich. And I jumped off the roof. I grabbed my father's. Uh, he had a he had this really big spotlight that he used to use when he went crabbing at night. And he'd put the light in the water and the crabs would come right up to the light. And he'd scoop them in the boat. And uh, I got up there on the roof and I did like a Morse code. And when I did this Morse code, these three points of light stopped dancing. So then my buddy did it. And when he did it, they did it back what he did and then i did it again and one of them dropped down from as high as a star to just right above the air traffic coming out of manhattan you know coming out of laguardia or kennedy airport and it just stood there and it was this big ball of light you know and we just freaked out you know we jumped off the roof we ran in my room we hid under the bed we slept under the bed that night you know in the morning when my father came to get us he pulled us out from under the bed he's like the hell are you doing under the bed you know and like ufo came down last night you know he's like oh just don't give me this bullshit with these ufos you know but like i said growing up in my house my brother being so much older than me he had books on everything Everything you could think of, he and he read on. And after he read it, I read it. You know what I mean? It was like a it was like a paranormal library in the next room. So as soon as he was done with something, I couldn't get it fast enough to so you know to read it. You know, um, so that that was like the first time I thought, wow, you know, UFOs are real. And then right after that, I started having a lot of weird experiences. Um, I never slept walk before that. And all of a sudden, I'm walking. My mother and father are watching Johnny Carson one night, and I come out of the bedroom and I'm taking these giant steps. And my and I don't remember this. This is what they told me. My father said, "Where the hell are you going?" And I told him, "Going home." And he goes, "Home?" And he goes, "I go, yeah." And he goes, "Where's home?" And I said, "The moon." I told him I was from the moon. And my father kicked me in the ass and he sent me back in the bed. Now, when you grow up in the city, every block is a different nationality, okay? So, you know, you can go one block and you're dealing with, you know, black guys, Spanish guys, Jewish guys, Irish guys. I moved from an all Italian neighborhood to an all Irish neighborhood. I had to fight my way through every single guy on that, in that neighborhood to get any kind of respect, okay? And I took a lot of shots in the face, and my nose never bled. Fat lip, busted black eye, never a bloody nose. Right after I had that UFO experience, I started waking up with terrible nosebleeds. And I would wake up with blood all over the cushion, all over the wall. And I asked my father, say, hey, Pop, what's going on? You know, why is it all the, got all these nosebleeds, you know? And my father would say, oh, it's because you don't stay still at night. You bounce around and you hit your face against the wall and you start bleeding. But I had dudes punch me square in my nose a hundred times and my nose never bled, you know? So, but as a kid, I just took it for what he said, you know? I didn't really think much about it until I got older. And so I was like, wait a minute, you know how many times I got punched in the nose and my nose never bled? I'm going to make myself bleed sleeping, you know? didn't make any sense and you know my brother was always after me to get like um regressed and stuff like that you know but I was like no I'm not I don't need that shit I'm not getting regressed you know I'm good and then you know it's like at 12 years old I was down in South Florida we had our first I had my first skunk ape incident which was totally insane that freaked me out for like two years. I couldn't sleep in my room for two years because my room originally was a front porch. And my father was a carpenter and he closed it off and he made a bedroom out of it. And it was like a prison cell, you know, it was like 10 feet long and five feet wide. And that was it. And the only windows he had in his carpenter shop 
was a picture window. So I had this big picture window. And I used to think that this creature was going to come in, reach in through the window, break, grab me and take me, even though I'm living in the middle of the city. You know, I'm out from Florida. It was just for two years. I really had really bad uh, SP, whatever they call it, PSD, whatever it's called. I don't know. But um, PTSD. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I couldn't sleep for like two years. Yeah. And then, you know, obviously you get over it, you know. But, uh, you you can't just wash over that, Al. You got to tell us about the first skunk ape thing. Oh, uh, no, please. No. Uh, let's talk about the stuff <laughs> I sent you. I told that story so many times. It's so old, you know. Uh, 74, South Florida, visiting my sister, my brother-in-law, me and my cousin. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go just over the highlights of it. Um, we we were we had a deal we had skunk ape there was it was a it was a what you call it, a drought that year in south florida and the evergades were on fire and all the animals were coming inland and my sister's house was right on the cusp of the everglades a uh, little town called davy the biggest thing that happened there was the rodeo on the fourth of july dirt streets everybody's pickup truck had three guns in the window you know what i mean it was a real cowboy town and uh <laughs> the skunk ape comes through one night and he attacks he attacks a buddy of mine's horse father had a horse he had a horse ranch and he would take tours out in the swamp and he had this horse that he just gotten from montana wyoming had him out in the corral couldn't put him in the stalls because he'd kick make all the other horses nuts so he had a seminole indian working a horse every day trying to break it well this skunk ape Nine foot thousand pound skunk ape sneaks up on this horse, grabs it by its hind quarters. The horse kicks out, jumps the corral, goes into the pasture. The the horse rancher comes out of the house with his dirty dirty. He's blasting away. We can see the muzzle flash from our house because everything in Florida is flat, and there was a development was only half built, so there was a lot of um, empty space in between homes. And we could see the muzzle flash, and my brother wants to jump on our dirt bikes. We had dirt bikes. Go over there, see what's going on. We went over, we see what happened. He told the sheriff what happened. The next day, the Seminole went out, got the horse, brought him back to the corral. And when he did, the horse had handprints on its hind quarters. Like if I was to grab you by your wrist and squeeze as hard as I could and leave the indentation, that's what it had. It's on its hind quarters. Um, Long story short, a couple of weeks go by, and where my brother-in-law and sister-in-law, my sister are coming back from a, 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 an outing in, in Miami, and uh, they just pull into the driveway. It's late at night, 2 o'clock in the morning. And when we run out to the car, because the dogs are going crazy, she had two giant German shepherds. And um, we run out to the car, my brother-in-law says, any action tonight? And we say, no, quiet night. No sooner than we say that. We hear a blood curdling scream just send chills down your spine nobody knew what it was scared my sister so to death she grabbed both dogs and ran into the house and locked us out we jumped in my brother-in-law's car and we head off to where the screams come from because right after we heard the scream we seen a double barrel shotgun go off boom both barrels right so my brother says jump in the car see what's going on this guy was a cattle ranch he lived up the street from us had a white Brahma bull with a hump in its back. The day, if the thing weighed 2,500 pounds and it weighed an ounce, okay? We get, we get to the corner, and as we get to the corner, the deputy is patrolling. We get stuck behind the deputy, and we're just crawling, you know? Deputies, he's got his light on the, where the Everglades is, the swamp is, looking for the creature, and we could see a car at the far end of the development. It was, it was a giant square. And it was two miles square. And um, as everybody's looking to the left, this creature runs out of the darkness from the right. The deputy's car hits it like he hit a like he hit an oak tree. Okay, creature stumbles back, takes down a bus sign, school bus sign or something, gets back up, and I'm hanging out of the sunroof of my brother-in-law's brand new Lincoln Continental Mark IV. My cousin's riding shotgun. And I'm hanging out the sunroof. And as this thing is walking past us, a car length in front of us, my brother-in-law hits it with the high beams because he wants to get a good look at it, you know? 
Now I had gotten a good look at it one night when it was in the in our front yard, and it looked like King Kong to me. Okay, um, walks over to the deputy's car, looks right down at the deputy, screams at him, and you could feel the scream go through you, even from behind the windshield. Does a hammer punch on the front of the car, and the back of the police car comes off the ground. And the deputy is just sitting there with his hands on a steering wheel, and we can see his silhouette. And the shotgun is in between him and the passenger side because that's where they had it back then. And it limps off into the swamp. At this point, the sheriff comes racing down. He sees the car totaled. Tell, asks what happened. The deputy's giving him a report. He asked us, we're giving him a report, the same thing the deputy told him. He asked the deputy, why didn't you shoot it? And he was like, the shotgun wasn't big enough. Now, I, the way I got the size of this creature was I figured it was about nine foot tall because we had a fence that went around the side of our house in the back that was six foot to keep the dogs in because they were both canine German Shepherds. They were big bone, 125 pounds each. And... Um, this thing was head and shoulders above that fence, at least three feet taller than the fence. Yeah. And I go, I know I'm I'm light on this, but I always say about a hundred pounds per foot. So if it was nine feet tall, it had to be at least nine hundred pounds. At this point, the cattle rancher comes driving up in his pickup truck and he tells the, the sheriff, You gotta see what this damn creature did to my prize bull. We're like, What? This bull was the size of a minivan. So he goes, he follows the, the cattle rancher. We go around the deputy. We follow the sheriff. We get to the pasture, and the, dep the sheriff is panning the pasture with a spotlight, and there in the middle of the pasture is this white Brahma bull bleeding out with no head. And then he pans in some more, and about 100 yards away is the head on the other side of the pasture. And the, I mean, hindsight being 2020, he may have had calves in that, in that pasture, and maybe the skunk ape was after the calves and the bull was defending the cows. But um, for this thing to rip this bull's head off, like when you, I tell people all the time, when you see these things with your own two eyes, your brain can't comprehend what your eyes are seeing. It just can't because they're not supposed to exist. Your brain just can't, like it shuts down. It's like, you know, and your your eyes are looking at this thing, and your your brain is telling you it's a monster. You know, and uh, it went into the swamp, and they came with horses and dogs and helicopters. They never found anything. Friend of mine found um, he was swimming in the cattails because he believed that they lived in the swamp. Because every time they would get to the swamp. They would lose them. The, the sheriff could never track them once they got into the canals. And we were surrounded by canals because we were on the outskirts of the Everglades. And a friend of mine was swimming in the cattails. He found some kind of cavern. He swam in it. He came up an underground cavern. He said that stunk to high heaven, burnt his eyes, and he could he could make out like holes in the in the in the in the in the, in the earth that looked like caves, you know. And when he came out and he came to me, he was bouncing off off the ground. He was, couldn't stand still. He was so excited. You know, he was like, you got to come with me. You got to come with me. And he stunk to high heaven. He smelled like the skunk ape when it went by our house one night. And he's telling me, you got to come with me. You got to show you. And I was like, dude, there's no way I'm going in. The, I'm not going in the canal to begin with because there's alligators in there. That's number one. And water moccasins. Never mind swimming into the lair of the skunk ape, it just ripped the head off of a Brahma bull. Are you nuts? You know what I mean? I'm like, think about it. If your father got up in the middle of the night to piss and he seen some dude in his house, he's going to shoot him and then ask questions later, you know? Mm -hmm. And I said, this thing popped the head off a of Brahma bull. What do you think it's going to do to your little head, you know? And like I said, my friend wasn't a great liar. He, he, was, he was a real redneck rebel kind of kid, you know, never had any shoes on, ran across gravel like it was paved pavement, you know what I mean? And we all rode horses in the swamps and dirt bikes and we all took our guns and we went in the swamp and we target shot, you know what I mean? Everybody had guns back then. Nobody shot anybody and uh you know, and then he told me he made me swear that I wouldn't tell anybody because <laughs> he was afraid that the sheriff would come and um blow up those caverns, you know what I mean? And and not only kill the skunk gate, but destroy the area that we hung out in 
and you know had our bonfires in and stuff like that but that's a long short version of a long story that was awesome <laughs> yeah all, all i've got to say is if you saw a shotgun blast and you drove over <laughs> to the neighbor's house and the cops were already there they've got the quickest response time in florida no no uh, they because when way better when, than here when yeah. um when the horse ranch's horse got attacked the sheriff did say to, to, to him, he said, we're going to pick up the patrols out here because you guys are on the outskirts. And he said, we're going to pick up the patrols because, you know, we, like I said, the place was called Sunshine Acres, but it was like a one lane bridge over nothing but canals. There was canals all around us, every, you know, in all four directions. And uh, there, were, there weren't a lot of homes developed at that time, just a couple here and there and the, the horse rancher was at the beginning of the development and the cattle rancher was at the back of the development. And, uh, so, you know, we knew what the dirty, dirty looked like going off at night. Cause we shot them in the woods at night when we had bonfires, you know, we knew what a double power shotgun looked like going off at night. So, but like, so we just, if we would have got to that corner, like one second sooner, we would have never seen that creature come out of the darkness. We would have never seen it hit the police car. We would have never seen any of that. But we, the way we just it just worked out perfect that that deputy it, happened to be there. So your family that was down there, did did anything happen? Like if you were only visiting, is that what you said? You were only yeah, visiting? Yeah, down there? that was for my, my sister's house was my summer camp. Like, you know, people send their kids away to camp. Well, me yeah. and my cousin Anthony got sent away every year down there because my brother-in-law was an ex-Marine and he had a list of stuff that he wanted done around the house. And we were free labor. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. From popcorn and ceilings to painting the house to, to building uh, planters for my sister and her flowers. We did it all. You know what I mean? Well, well did other stuff happen after that as far as yes. Booker Right after we flew back to New York, on the other side of the canal was another horse ranch. Um, and that guy's name was Ralph. He was good friends with my brother-in-law. And Ralph's horse had just had a uh, a pony, I guess, a boy, was born. And um, this creature broke into the barn and killed the pony, snapped its neck. It was carrying it off. But when it broke into the barn, it must have stepped on a nail or sliced its foot somehow because it was leaving a blood trail. And Ralph called all his higher hands up and they all came out. My brother-in-law actually joined them because they were really good friends. And they put a posse together and they tracked this thing right up to the swamp. I guess they must have been gaining on it on their horses. You know what I mean? Because the thing left the dead pony and didn't take it with him once it jumped into the water. And they found the horse dead, yeah, with a broken neck. And that happened right after we left to go back to New York, yeah. Damn. So how, how many years did you go back and forth? And I mean, did you spend a lot of summers in Florida? Oh, I spent a lot of summers in Florida since I was about from maybe 10 to about 15. Yeah, something like that. Maybe four or five years. We had just, you know, Florida was was great. I mean, we had our dirt bikes down there. Uh, we would shovel shit at the ranch to make some money to buy beer, to have our bonfires. If we weren't shoveling shit at the horse ranch's farm, we were taking tours out in the, in the swamp to make money. You know what I mean? The horses knew where they were going anyway. We just, yeah. They just needed somebody on the front of the line and the back line so nobody fell off into the swamp, you know? The horses knew the trail and, and right back and right back to the ranch and everything. It was fun. I loved it, man. That's where I learned how to ride horses, and I love riding horses, and I've always loved riding horses. And you know, I was I was in my element. I should have been born a cowboy, believe me. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of people don't associate horses and cowboys with Florida, but like where I'm at here in North Alabama, there was a man that that I used to I used to shoot a lot of a lot of pool and pool hall, and it was an old man that he he died about a year ago, but he moved here in the early 70s and that's where he he was in davy florida oh he, wow he worked on a uh, a dairy farm and that's okay. what he did he worked on a dairy farm gathering up the cows to be milked yeah, yeah no. when you said davy florida 
because I've heard him say Davy, Florida a thousand times. Yeah, uh, actually, a woman from the BFRO took my report off of the the Skunk Ape Museum down in Florida. She's seen it and she took it. She put it on the BFRO. She lived in the next town over, not um, not Cooper City, but the one to our east or west. I forgot the name of it. Um, and her father had a had a mechanic shop in uh, Davy, and she she when she took my report, she put all of the newspaper report sightings at the end of my thing on the BFRO. It's called the South 1974 South Florida uh, sighting. She took all the newspaper clippings and she put it in there. And she took a, a a rendering of the creature I seen. So Billa Irwin did my rendering for me, and she put that in there. And she actually got a, a Google Alert shot of Sunshine Acres, what it looks like today. And she marked off like the cattle rancher was here, and the horse rancher was here, and his house was right here. And she did an amazing job. And she told me a story that her uncle was a cop in Cooper City, which was the next town to our east or south, I don't remember, I think it was to our east. And um, they would get reports of peeping toms. Now, again, you got to understand, this is 1974, no sidewalk, dirt roads, cowboy, this is cowboy country. And they would get reports that there's a large black man looking in my window. So the cops would go there and they would, they would go for like a different parts of like, they'd come around, and they would hit it with the splashlight and there would be a skunk ape right there. We'd see the cops. It would turn, run, dive into the swamp, into the canal, and it was gone. And she yep. said her uncle had so many reports like that, that she, he had two books, an official book and an unofficial book. And she was going to get that unofficial book from him. And when he passed away, she was going to put it out as a Bigfoot you know, book from, from you know, South Florida at that time, you know? We had a long conversation. She was a real sweetheart. She did a great <laughs> job. Yeah. So uh, apparently, I mean, you you had a uh, very active childhood to deal with, with the, the ghost, specter, spooks, cryptids, and all that. My favorite question to ask people is what is the most traumatizing, scariest thing that you've ever encountered personally? Oh, the, that 74 Bigfoot thing was definitely uh, traumatized me the most. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. If I would have done regression and found out that they were doing it, you know, aliens were doing all kinds of crazy shit to me. It would have freaked me out too, but yeah. I wasn't going down that road. But um, yeah, no, that freaked me out for like we, where I lived, even though I lived in the city, we had a um, woods behind our house and our woods let, led, you can go from our woods all the way to this really big, big patch of woods down in the Bronx which was called Van Cortland Woods. The Van Cortland family, a very rich, prominent family in New York. And they donated like 3,000 acres in the middle of the woods to the, to the, to the Bronx as a park. And they actually had their own uh, cemetery in the middle of the woods. And we would go down there. They had horses down there. They had stables. And we would work down there cleaning the stables. And, you know, we had keys to the stable. We would take horses out at night and the cops would chase us and everything on their motorcycles. <laughs> and, uh, but so I loved, you know, so those woods were like my second home. Okay. When I came back from Florida that summer, going down into those woods, I was okay during the day. But the minute that that tree canopy started to get dark, I was out of there like the flesh. Yeah, yeah. I didn't stop running. And it was a good, like, two miles, you know. I didn't stop running until I got to my back gate. You know what I mean? Yeah. It changes a person's it changes. Outlook. It changes, yeah. You have to get used to this stuff, you know. You, it's not something that uh, people can get used to, especially, like, like I, and again, I can't emphasize enough. People say, oh, why don't you? You were there. Why don't you take a picture of this? Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? When you're face-to-face -face with these things, and they're larger than life. This one was four feet wide, and it looked like he was four feet thick, okay? He had a conical head. He was black with red tint. He had canines. He actually, at one point, one night, he was going through the yard, and the sensor lights went on. And we were sleeping behind this giant picture window on a pull-out couch in my sister's sunroom, okay? 
and the sensor lights went on and we seen this giant shadow go across the wall so the dogs went crazy i grabbed the dogs threw them in the garage did a belly crawl like an army crawl back to the window and i peeked out the window to see what was out there and it must have seen its own reflection in the glass and it did like this incredible Hulk flex and scream that went right through that window. I thought that window was going to break. Okay. And, uh, man, to me, it just looked like King Kong to me. Yeah. It was not a happy camper, you know, I guess, you know, if your home is being burnt up by fires and you have to go somewhere where you're not, you don't want to be, you wouldn't be happy either. You know? Yeah. You said it had canines. Did it, it had canines? Did it, did it wow. open its mouth? Were it the opened canines? its mouth and screamed. Went, ah, yeah, like that. Yeah. I want. I wonder if what you're talking about is what a lot of people refer to as like a a, a gugway or like a type uh three. Uh, did it have like a baboon face? What like nah, did this, it have this, this was this was. This was definitely a Bigfoot or you know, what they call skunk ape. There was, this was not a Gugway, no way, no shape. This was a Sasquatch or what they call a skunk ape. It was just, it was an alpha and it was pissed that it had to be in town when it didn't want to be in town. Like I said, the Everglades were on fire that summer. You know, there was just a lot of fires because of the drought. So it was probably, it might have been, you know, just pushed out of its home and it was upset that it even had to be like moving around and everything. Did did it look more human or more apish? Apish. Definitely looked more like I said, to me it looked like King Kong. You know, it's what it looked like. It was it was a monster, man. You know, it's like when I was a kid and people asked me what what I seen, I said, I seen a monster. Don't tell me <laughs> monsters don't exist because I seen one, you know. Right. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Yeah, no, it was it was it was a crazy experience, you know. And we went back the next year. And I'll be honest with you, we went we went back the next year. Um I didn't sleep against that window in that sunroom. <laughs> I slept I slept on the couch in the living room. There was no way I was sleeping up against that glass ever again. You know? Right. Yeah. I don't think I slept in that on that bed until I was about 18, you know, and then I was going down for the Fort Lauderdale Strip and, you know, stuff like that, you know, to hang out at the clubs and on the beach and stuff. Did, since whenever the stuff happened at the neighbor's place, and you're talking about the, the cattle dude and the horse rancher and all that kind of stuff, and the sheriffs are patrolling more often because stuff happened out there. So did everybody in the neighborhood, were they all, like, aware of yes. What? So when did, the, the first they, night they walked past the house, okay, and we smelled that horrible, then the other way I could describe it is like a thousand skunks, okay? And we told my sister, my brother-in-law, the next day, that morning, you know, for breakfast, someone by the house stunk to high heaven. Dogs went absolutely insane. We had to put them in the garage. And they said it was the skunk ape. And we just, me and my cousin just looked at each other like, skunk ape? What's a skunk ape? We thought they were bull bullshitting us. Until we went and hung out with our friends after lunch, right? Because we would work from like eight to one in the morning in the afternoon, and then we'd meet our friends and we'd go either swimming in the pool or the man-made lake or out into the swamp, and we was hanging out talking to all the the, the locals. The local kids mm -hmm. like, yeah, when it gets hot like this, they come around. It wasn't like a big deal to them, you know. They knew about it because they lived on the outskirts. Wasn't a big deal. I'd have been, <laughs> I'd have been like, "What the hell is the skunk ape thing? Tell me all about it." Wasn't they a big grew deal. up with it, though. They grew up with it. You know, they've heard stories from their grandparents and stuff like that. You know, it's just generational down there. If if all of that happened in Florida, which is ways away from New York, so. Go ahead. Squirrel must have a serious delay with the internet. Yeah, yeah, today. yeah. She's, she's having a problem. I'm, I'm cutting out. Yeah. Can you hear Misty? 
turn your camera off and just talk. That might help. Can you hear us, Squirrel? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. It's, I'm really, really delayed. What were you going to ask him? I was, just, I was going to ask him about the pictures that he sent. Um, was that uh, in New York? Is that what this is? Yes, this is one of my research uh, spots here in the Hudson Valley. Yeah. Let's see. Uh oh, hang on a second. Let me see if I can go back. <laughs> Told y'all it wasn't just sorry, me. The damn, the damn stream yard controls, they don't want to act like normal. I don't know what's going on. Here, Misty, I'll do it. I'll, I'll run through it. He can just explain all this. Al, what are okay. we looking at here? Okay, well, I was I was um, walking a uh, path. I don't know if I sent you the picture of the lake, whatever. There's, I was rehabbing my ankle, I had ankle surgery. And I was going to this park, rehabbing my ankle, walking. It had like a two mile trail that started in this park and then went along, around this lake, along the base of the mountain. And um, one day I get to the park and, uh, and I hear this screaming going off on the top of the mountain, just screaming to high heaven. And all the young mothers that were in the park with their children, the little infants, they're all grabbing their kids and they're running to their cars. They're leaving their strollers behind. They're leaving their really? uh they're leaving their the the their bags with the bottles and the diapers behind, and they're getting out of Dodge. And um I'm listening to this thing just going off in high heaven when a sheriff pulled in and he was there patrolling the park and he heard it and he was like, um, what the hell is that? And, um, he told me, he goes, I'd advise you to leave. And I was like, no, nope, I'm going walking. I got to rehab my ankle and I'm going right past those, that mountain. So I'm going that way, you know? So I went, I started walking. And then when I got to that mountain where the screaming was going on, I just took a couple of photographs, up into the mountain randomly where I heard the screaming was going off. And I caught two images, one image that looked like a, a Sasquatch on the top of the mountain. And I, and I, I got the far image. I sent you the far image and the blown up image. And you can see, it looks like a, a big foot up on top of the hill. Anyway, I come as I'm walking along this mountain range, I'm not going to name the range cause it's got an Indian name. Um, I come to a, tr I come that looks like there's a trail that goes up the mountain. So I come to this trail and I said, let me just take a walk up this trail a little ways and see what, see what I find. So as I go up this trail, I find one footprint that looks like something ran down the mountain. It looked like a heel print, like something hit hard with its heel. And maybe a hundred feet above that, I found something that one footprint that looks like a palm of a foot pushing off, going back up. But those were the two only two things I found. And I took pictures of them and I went back down. And again, this is a wide open. This is a trail that's like four feet wide. So the next day I come there and there's a little tree bent over, like somebody put a little tree over to stop me from going up. So I said, oh, this is interesting. There's a tree here. So I go up a little further. And as I go up further, I pass where the, the footsteps were. I get about halfway up, maybe, I don't know. I don't know how, how long this trail is. This is probably one of the shorter ones because it goes straight up. Um, I find something that looks like a, a, a grave. It's got a, hundreds of little rocks on top with a giant rock that looks like a headstone, okay? I take pictures of that from all there. I go into the woods. I take pictures of it at all different angles. I call Chris Reinhardt up and I tell Chris, dude, I, I, I found this location just by accident. Yeah, right there. Those are the pitch, those are the footprints I found. That's the trail. 
that goes up. This is the one I think that was going up. I think that was the the, uh, the ball of the foot. And the other one, I think, was the one coming down. And I tell Chris about it. And I said, I think it's an act. Yeah, see, that was another one. I think that was the one coming down. And um, so I tell Chris about it. And Chris says, um, why don't you, do you ever, did you ever do anything with string? And I was like, no. He goes, why don't you put some string up there and see what happens? And I sent him the picture of the, the grave. It looks like a grave. I think he was the one who actually found my name chiseled in a rock. It says Al. So I put these strings up, these different colors. First, I started with a yellow string. And I just put a little yellow string up, and I left. The next day I came back, there was, there was a log in front of the trail, just one log, like six-foot log. It looked like it was cut, okay? Um, I don't know where they got the log from. I didn't see any other things cut in the, in the woods. Um, the next day I come back, and the string, they started messing with the string. They tied them up in little knots. They tied them together like this. So every really? day I would go, uh, yeah, every day I would go back. Yeah, look, at, they did that. I mean, like, every day I would go, I just tied it so it would hang straight. I didn't do anything special with it. Every day I would go back and I'd put a different color string. And then the following day, there would be a different, different. one day there was a yellow star. I put a yellow string, there was a yellow star. Like a child's toy, like something went over to where the little kids were playing and picked up a child star. Yeah. And then... The next day, I'd put like a green one, and one day there was like a green um, a lacrosse ball there. Then I would put a different color one, a, 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 a fluorescent green one or something like that. And yeah, that this is the lake. Yeah, that's the mountain range. And there would be like a green golf, like a fluorescent green golf. Oh, no, it was orange. I did an orange string. Yeah, right there, my it says my name, Al. And I put an orange string, and it was an orange golf ball. Every day was something different. And every day I'd go back, there would be another log. And it was two logs. And then it was three logs. And I was like, something doesn't want me to go up this trail. This so is their every way. Day, every day you went up there, there was another log on the damn trail? I yeah, wouldn't have gone it, up there. Well, I was, I was in research <laughs> mode. I was, I was, I couldn't, I couldn't, yeah, see, that's the image right there. I was just taking photographs. It's not like I knew there was something there. And it looks like a Sasquatch staying on top of the mountain to me. You know, that's one man's opinion, okay? Um, and every day I'd go back, I'd do something different, a different string. There would be uh, the, up until there was like three logs, and it was three logs. And then I did all these different color strings. And then I started finding footprints around the swamp part of the lake okay and i said okay yeah that's the close-up of the the long shot and if you blow this up you can see my name is chiseled in there it says al now to me that looks like a a, a what you would call it a, a grave you know it's in the middle of the woods on top of a mountain and that's a native american mountain and that rock that headstone that i call a headstone is got away a couple of tons it's huge so anyway, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, and not really, you know, I'm researching, I'm in research mode, even though I'm rehabbing my ankle. I'm walking to rehab my ankle because I just had ankle surgery done. Yeah, there's a fire tower on top of that mountain too. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm walking and I start finding structures. I start finding these little, these little, what I call little tree stars, okay? Uh, the deeper, the higher up I went, the deeper I went, I would go up and then I would go off trail. Like I would get pulled this way. I would get pulled that way. And I would find these structures, <laughs> but down below. Oh, where the, oh, Sorry, carry on. <laughs> so, um, one point they, um, they put, and, I, and I'm thinking these were gifts for me, right? I'm taking the star. I'm taking all the balls. And then at one point, they put a deer's head on top of the tree, the Is tree that, structure. So that's what that skull was at the yeah. beginning? Yes. But when, when, but when I found it originally, I couldn't find the pictures in, my, in my, uh, my database. But when I found it originally, it was the summertime. And it was still membrane on the deer. 
So I wasn't going to take that. I wasn't going to take that home with me. I just kind of left it there, you know? And right. Th and then um, at one point, they gave me a turtle shell, just the, just the shell. And I was like, what the hell is this, you know? And I wasn't sure if I should take it or not because I don't want to be bringing anything home with me, you know, any bad energy, you know? And I didn't know what this meant. And so then... Is God. Is, yeah, is first that... thing... Yeah, first thing game. Go ahead. There we go. Well, I'm trying to get it back to. The, I guess these are the pictures that Misty had. Yeah, is that the is that the turtle shell? Yes, that's a turtle shell. But originally, it was just a shell. Then okay. one day I went back, and there were two or three dead moles inside the shell. Like it was, it was set up like a, a dinner plate or something, you know. And I was like. Um, no, I'm not going to take the, thank you for the, I'm, and I'm talking to the woods, right? Thank you for the gift, but I'm <laughs> not going to take the, the dead moles back with me. You know, I'm going to leave them here. And eventually they must've took the moles out. They flipped the shells over and they started putting feathers underneath the shell. And I don't know what kind of feathers they were. They, then they made a what you would call. They made a glyph. There, there you are. There's the moles right there. They're the moles, right? Yeah, inside the shell. Yeah, yeah. I think there's three of them in there. Um, then they started making glyphs on the grounds with bones and sticks. You know, well, we got we got that too. Apparently, this stuff is like. Out of order. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't Hold think on. there was any any order to it. To be honest with you, I was just there, sending them to me. right there. Is, that's the bones. Those are the bones, and that stick. You can see that stick is underneath one of the. To me, this is a glyph. They're trying to tell me something. I don't know what they're trying to tell me, but this is a glyph. But the whole time I'm doing this, I get like an aha moment. I realize that every time I put a color string out, they give me a gift of the same color. So I'm thinking, wow, maybe I never thought of this, but since they have human DNA, maybe they see color like we see color, right? So now, right. So now I went crazy with all these different color strings, and every time I changed them, they, they would, like I said, a green, yellow, whatever color it was, they would give me a gift the same color, you know? So I'm saying, oh, well, these things definitely see in color. Now, I know they can see IR, but now they, now I know they see in color like us, which doesn't surprise me now because they have human DNA, okay? And then another aha moment I had in this particular investigation was not this track, but I think there's another track where it's flat. It doesn't have a mid tarsal break, okay? This is a... Uh, this is up in the Hudson Valley in New York State. That was another gift. They gave me a couple of quartz crystal stones. That was a twist I found off trail. Um, they, um, this it's one the, right here. That's the one without the mid tarsal. This, right? this one, and I, you know, for years I thought anything that didn't have a mid tarsal break was a was a hoax. And then I'm looking at it. I had the aha moment with the color. Like, wow, these things get seen color. So then I said, why can't they have flat feet? Humans can have flat feet, with no arches. Why can't they be born with a defect and not a mid torso break? And that's when I started to realize that, you know, all of those footprints that I've seen over the years that I discarded throughout because they didn't have a mid torso probably were Sasquatch that may have had some kind of foot defect and just didn't have the mid torso break, you know? And those were two aha moments for me. You know? And every time I'd have one of these aha moments, I'd call Chris Reinhardt. And I was like, dude, you know, I just had an aha moment, you know. And, you know, you, go ahead, Missy. No, I apologize. My, my grandmother had polio and um, she couldn't bend her ankles and she was really flat footed. Her, like we would go to the beach or something like that. Her footprint was so much different than ours because her feet didn't bend the same way that ours did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it took me, it seemed like it took me forever to really come around to the non mid tarsal break being a real Sasquatch and not a hoax, you know? 
um, because I had it in my head from a long, from the very beginning that anything with a flat foot is a hoax. And then, but then when I had that aha moment that they see in color and I'm like, well, if they have human DNA and they can see in color, we see in color, we have flat feet. We don't know. I know people with no arches. They could have flat feet too. Could just be a, a birth effect like it is with us. And then I put those two things together and that like, this particular investigation, I had two aha moments with that, you know, for some reason, just never crossed my mind in all the years of investigating. I'm having yeah. a hot show. My internet ain't working. She but, likes um, it. I agree. That could, I mean, that could definitely be something going on with that because I know she didn't, when she walked, she couldn't even hardly, she would trip a lot and fall well, because she didn't pick her feet up good. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's just, it's just for some stupid reason, it never really dawned on me that they could have, they could be, be, have birth defects where there may be some without mid torsal breaks, you know, not everything right. that doesn't have a mid torsal breaks is a hoax. And it no, took, well, it took the light bulb to go off with the color thing to, to set that one off, you know? You know that there are a lot of tracks that people find that sometimes they have three toes. Yep. or four toes, whether it is a matter of like a uh, interbreeding or, or just, uh, you know, if you live out in the woods and you don't have shoes, I mean, maybe some of them get a toe ripped off or something like that. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I'm just simply saying there are a lot of three toed tracks, a lot of four toed tracks, stuff like that. If there is that kind of anomaly, you know, do you look at it and you go, Oh, well, it's three toed or four toes so therefore it's not a booger you know because it doesn't have five toes what i'm saying is with the mid tarsal break not only could it be flat footed but you also have to take into consideration i guess the terrain that it's walking on and the way it would be walking i mean your foot will flex different if you're going downhill versus uphill if you're if you're walking level, if you're carrying something heavy, so the mid tarsal break is not that big of a uh, credential thing as far as going. Oh, that's a booger track, and I, I mean I I found tracks that I didn't see a clearly defined mid tarsal break, but nonetheless they were an inch and a half in the ground, you know. So yeah, no, I, I get it, I, but it took a long time for me to come around to that because I had my mind made up that if it didn't have a mid torsal break, it was a hoax. You know, it's just right. sometimes you sometimes you get stuck in in your ways and you don't think differently. It took something else for the light bulb to go off on to make the light bulb go sure. off on this as well. You know, and it's just you know it is what it is. Like this, you know finding this off trail this all this thing is pinned down underneath that stick it's actually but if this stick was to fall it was standing parallel to this tree there would have been no way it could have pulled that little tree down you know it was impossible right. yeah yeah so it just it just it really opened up the, the a lot of stuff to me this i i felt like i learned a lot on this investigation and and maybe they do bury their dead, you know, if they die here and they do bury their dead. And that's why we don't find their bones and stuff like that or any skeletal remains. But like if you come across something that big and that and that that grave is got to be from the beginning of the stone to the end of the stone it's got to be 10, 12 feet long five feet wide and then if you add the stone on top of it that stone itself is like two and a half feet you know what i mean either they buried a giant there or a sasquatch is buried there one or the other but the, like i said the mountain itself it was native american you know it was like um a uh, sacred space for them up here you know the iroquois indians and so um i i don't know it's the, it's the only thing i and all the years of walking through the woods, and I got five or six different sites that I that I go around to. I rotate to, you know, because I know when they're going to be at certain times of the year at certain sites. I've never found anything like that, you know. Well, 
first of all, can you talk a little bit more about uh, your opinion of the Native American link to it, like what you were just talking about? And also, did you just say you, you've got certain sites where you know they're going to be at a certain time of year? Are you saying that they that they move through different territory at different times of the year? And how yeah. on earth did you figure out like where they would be? Because there's a lot of people that would like to get ahead of them and be able to uh, figure that out. I think every location that I investigate, and I think I have like, I'm up to six now, um, all have different clans there. That's not the same family unit at all six locations. I believe, again, just one man's opinion. I sure. believe their range is circular and not linear. I don't believe they go from north to south. I think they move in a circle, like the way the moon goes around the earth. Yeah. It's, you know what I mean? So, and I think when they're at this location in the spring, directly, that's, that's the west part of the circle. On the east side of the circle, they'll be there in the fall. You know what I mean? And then, you know, the south side, they'll be in the winter. And the northern side, they'll be in the dead of summer. I think it takes them that long to go through their range, a year, to go to circle through it. And like I said, uh, if I'm investigating what I call the sacred site, which I usually investigate in the fall, October, because I know they're always going to be there, then I'll go to this location in the in the spring, like this time of the year now. I would be going to this other location because that's when... I came across them the day they were going, the one was going crazy up on the hill to get all those people out of the, out of the park and everything, you know? Um, and every time I go back in the spring is when I have encounters with them and uh, I find stuff, you know, whether it's new or old, but um, eventually I did take that uh, deer skull, you know, as a gift and, and the, and the feathers and the turtles shell. But, um, you know, wait, but I waited, you can see there was snow on it until all the membrane was gone. You know, I wasn't bringing it home with any membrane on it. And, uh, but those bird feathers, I have no kind of, no idea what bird it is. The only thing I could think of being that there's a lake there and there's a beach there, it's either goose or duck or something like that. But I have no idea what kind of feathers those are. Wait, hold on. Ow. So. <laughs> you, you took you took the skull and the shell mm -hmm. you took them. Mm -hmm. did any did anything happen to you after you took them like, like my point is a lot of people uh say stuff like sometimes they'll gift with you but if you take it like if you take it back home they'll follow you home and i know that's getting way out there like like, I don't know how to explain that physically. That's getting way out there. But did you have anything happen after you took the stuff away from that location? Not, I don't believe I ever had anything happen with this particular clan because this location is a really good distance from my house. But the clans that I, I gift with closer to home, have come by the house and left me gifts. Yes. What did they leave you? They usually leave me quartz crystal stones, like a raw quartz crystal stone, or they'll leave me a, a stick figure, or they'll leave me a pine cone, or you know stuff like that. Um, gifts like that, I'll get. Look, whenever you say a pine cone, I mean, like, is it? Something obvious like a pine cone on top of the picnic table where there was uh, they, there put, right they put they put everything on top of my fire pit. I have a red brick fire pit, and they put everything on top of my fire pit. I, yeah, it's fire pit. Yeah, so and they'll, and I've been at the fire pit when they've gone through because I have a hundred acres of land behind my house. It used to be all apple orchard, and directly across the street I have wetlands that are like swamps. And I've been at the fire pit with the fire burning, having a cold brew, listening to a show like yours, when I've heard them walk through. 
behind because, like I said, I have two yards. I have a front yard, a backyard that's all grass, you know, where the kids could play and yada, yada. And then I have a stone wall that divides it from the woods. And the woods is just all woods, you know. Um, so if they walk behind that stone wall, I can't see them because it's all, it's all brambles and brushes and trees and stuff like that. But I've heard them come through on multiple occasions, yeah, while I was at the fire pit. Or if I was sitting on the back deck, you know, and listening to a show on the, oh, would you? Yes, I know the turtle. The turtle represents, uh, it represents a lot to a lot of Native Americans. Yeah, I've looked into that. I have a Iroquois museum not far from my house that I spend a lot of time at, picking their brains and the. The more I, time I spend there, the more they open up to me and they tell me stuff, you know. So um, started off slow, but it's really gra grown into a very great, good relationship with the Iroquois. And uh, so they tell me stuff. Yes, the turtle. The turtle has a lot of meetings to a lot of different Native American tribes. Yes, absolutely. But um, I'll take it. I'll hold on to it. And then at some point, I'll bring it back and I'll re-gift it. And then yeah. they take it, and I don't know cool. what they do with it, but they must yeah. put it away for another day or something, you know. So I do That's stuff like right. that with I do stuff like that with them. I don't I don't keep it forever, you know. I'll regift it, but I don't regift it to a different clan. I'll always regift to the same clan because I don't know if I if it I'll insult them if I give them another clan's gift or something like that, you know. So do you th do you think that they they recognize you. They know you on a personal level. They're like, "Hey, that's my guy." Yes, I think they, they either they see what, they see my aura, or they sense my energy signature, and they know who I am immediately. Yeah, because like I said, I've been to a lot of locations, and I know that sometimes we we get herded out all the time when they want us to leave. They'll herd you out, you know, and. um I've never, even, even the times where I've had stuff thrown at me or could be considered an aggressive experience, I don't consider aggressive because nothing's ever happened. Yeah, they may have bluff charged me, you know, to move me along or something like that. Or they may have thrown a stone the size of that one giant stone into the lake over my head to, to get me out of there or something like that. I had one one time break a branch. It must have been a really big live branch because when it broke, it sounded like a 30 odd six going off by your head. If you like, would have been in the woods, you would have thought someone shot a gun, you know? I left. I left, Al. Well, that when they do stuff like that, then you do know it's time to leave. Yeah. I mean, and they heard you out. They, they, they guide you out. They, you. They'll, they'll get on either side of you and one in behind you, and they'll push you out to a certain ex uh, extent, and then they'll stop and they'll go back when they know you're you're actually leaving the the park. You know, you you've been bluff charged. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, man, tell me about it. No, nah, that's a whole other story. <laughs> that's a whole different a whole different investigation. But like I said. Um, but it's nothing. It's really nothing. It's just their way of getting you to move. I've never, see, I've never experienced what I would call aggressive behavior. To me, is them shaking the trees, ripping up the woods, just destroying the woods, pulling trees out by the roots, going absolutely apeshit crazy. You know what I mean? Right. That to me is aggressiveness. Them. Um, I did, I did have a monkey barking experience that was pretty crazy, you know, but even that I wouldn't consider aggressive because as, as aggressive as they were being, and I believe they were juveniles, I turned the tables on them and I, I confronted them. I walked towards them. And as I walked towards them screaming and yelling and cursing at them with my machete flashing in my headlamp so they could see it shining, they were backing up. You know what I mean? I turned the tables on them, but 
that was probably the most aggressive one. And the only reason I think that happens because I was with two women that night and they may have smelt the women and got excited, you know, because most yeah. of the time I'm with, I'm with men and that stuff doesn't happen. But, you know, like I said, I've never been injured. I've never been hurt. The only time I've ever been injured is one night they went absolutely crazy and they attacked a large pack of coyotes that were in the area and they were killing all the coyotes. They were just smashing them against the trees and stuff, you know? And I was just standing there and one of the coyotes was the size of a German Shepherd. He was looking over his shoulder to see if he was being chased by one and ran straight into me, sent me flying into a tree and I dislocated my shoulder. And I had to lean up against the tree and pop it back in, you know, which wasn't fun. But that wasn't, it wasn't them attacking me. It was them. Right. They were taking that on the coyotes because we were in between two of them. And they were just pissed off that we weren't leaving, you know. So they took it out on a pack of coyotes. But um, that was like the most aggressive thing that ever happened. I've been out there a million times at all of my locations with all kinds of people and no one's ever been hurt. Anything like so, you know, like when people say, oh, like I said, my, my definition of aggressive, being aggression is shaking trees and screaming at the top of their lungs or ripping trees out, just throwing them all over the woods. Greg, you know, Greg, Greg's had, Greg's had that happen. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what it's time to get out. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I've had these things cut me off from being able to get back to my truck. And uh, that's when it got bad. I mean, I'd, I'd have them get between me and the truck on the trail out. And that's that's when you get concerned. Yeah, I've had, I've watched these things. I've watched a dogwood tree like that big around. I couldn't see the last, say, 10 or so feet down because of the underbrush. But this dogwood was probably 25 feet tall. And I could see the whole top portion of that tree whip back and forth. It looked yeah. like a grown man with a sapling trying yeah. to jerk it out of the ground. And that mm -hmm. thing, it'd go round and round, then it'd go back and forth, back and forth, and it'd go this way. And this thing would scream. It, I was I was probably within 100 feet of this thing where it was doing this. And through the hardwoods, it was really like open hardwoods, about probably 80 feet. And then the last 20 feet was, it was a lot of underbrush and this thing would scream. And what it was is there was a guy way up on the highway was revving up a motorcycle and you could hear the, like when he had rev it up, like he was like, it sounded like he was messing with a carburetor, like it was flooding or something. <laughs> Got it. Rev it up. And it, what we were hearing was the motorcycle. It'd go, whoa, ma, whoa, ma. The dude revved that bike up three times. And when he let off of it that third time, right over where I'm sitting on the ground deer hunting right over my shoulder, just the distance I was telling you about a hundred feet, this thing, it was like a Bella roar scream. howl. started off like a bull bellowing and it ramp up into like a lion roaring, then into like a man screaming, then a woman screaming. And then it would be like a kind of like a, a cow howl on the end. And when that thing, when it would stop, when it would cut off so abruptly, it was like a whip cracking. It would be like a pop at the end. And this thing, would you, you could have just counted like one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, and it was like it's not going in. And I tell people a lot, and, I, and it's hard for people to understand this, that thing was so loud from 100 feet. Not only did I feel like I needed to, to cover my ears, my vision, it parts of this ramping up in that screen my eyeballs were like they were vibrating so hard. My vision would blur. Everything would get blurry and then it would clean up when, as soon as it would stop. And, uh, man, the thing about it, then I knew I was in a bad way, but my only way out of the woods from where I was at was I was going to have to go like that thing looking the road out for me would have been like where I'm looking would have been at 12 o'clock. This thing was at one o'clock. Okay. The Logging road going out with would have been within probably 35 40 feet of where this thing was at and i dang sure wasn't about to try that and uh, <laughs> and it, this this rocked on for a while and i had one of my buddies was with me he was uh through a big thicket in a greenfield we had and he was about 200 250 yards from me and he was hearing it from that distance 
and he'll tell everybody, you know, it was so loud on him that it was hurting his ears. And here I was about a hundred feet from it. And that's, that's one of my most traumatic experiences I ever had with these things is I, that thing was and the thing about it. Then when it would quit screaming, it wouldn't be, but just a few minutes, that stupid motorcycle, three quarters of a mile or a mile back up through the woods at the main road, it would rev up again. And as soon as that motorcycle would let off of it, this thing would be like three, two, one. It it do that whole bellow roar scream howl again. And it was just like, like the trees, like everything around me was shaking and were my vision. And, but it was like during the time that it, it would quit screaming, it was like just annihilating. It was like there was a circle, probably a 30 foot circle in this timber that it was destroying everything there. I'm talking about limbs sound like they were that big snapping. Like you was talking about sound like a 30 out six going off, just popping. Pow! And it's just shredding. And it's like trees are jerking back and forth. And this thing is stomping the ground and it's pacing back and back and forth, back and forth. And I sit there and in my mind, it was like I was listening to this thing work itself up into a frenzy. I'm yeah, talking, it was working itself up to was, a frenzy. Exactly. That's exactly what it was doing. He was amping himself up and just like he was just getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And man, I, that was, that's, like I said, that that's, if not my very most dramatic experience with them, that's, that's in the top two. Um, that's you know, one of the greatest Bigfoot experiences ever. Just saying, just saying. I've heard him say it like 30 times. Uh, I know he don't like talking about it, but that's one of the greatest Bigfoot things you're ever going to hear somebody say yeah, from it, somebody who didn't experience it. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, wanted, I wanted to be somewhere else. I mean, really bad. And my biggest fear was because at this point in time, I'd done been dealing with these things for several years. I done had a lot of encounters and Wait, where I was. Hold on, hold on. William H. Bonnie, because if that look, I've had branches broke and got, yelled at and had stuff thrown and everything. And I tell you, whenever I got my ass out of there, I got my ass out of there. I didn't go over there with my phone right after it was done and take pictures and look for limb snaps and all that kind of stuff. I'm not sorry, dude. I'm, I'm or I am sorry. I'm not trying to pick on you, but I'm simply saying, so a man that was in that situation and had all of that happening. And if you've ever heard Greg's story afterwards where he was puking from the adrenaline dump and everything. Yeah. I, didn't I, nobody I, stop and I take pictures. I didn't want to go back. I didn't have any care to go back and try to see what he was doing. I heard him doing it. And uh, what was traumatic on me was all these times, or 90% of these times we dealt with these things, them coming in around us, throwing stuff at us. You know, we'd hear them whoop. We'd hear them tree knock stuff. Usually when they would come in and when they would leave, they would always go toward the river. And there's a big lake and a river that feeds it uh, along this property. And when we'd have these encounters, 90% or more of the times, when they would leave where we were to go away from us, they would go toward the river. And what had been such a panic was where this thing's at. It was here. I'm here. And the river's behind me. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, if this thing gets It wants to get to the river and you're in its way. And, and my biggest fear was as soon as it pops out of this thick underbrush and it pops out in this hardwoods, I'm going to be the first thing it sees that's out of place and not supposed to be here. And all this worked up frustration is going to be targeted on me. Yes. And dude, I, hunt, I, hunt, I hunt with a Browning BAR Safari grade two semi-automatic 30 out six. And I carry a tactical Smith and Wesson 686 combat revolver 357 Oh, seven rounds, and it goes in a shoulder holster right here. If I'm in the woods, I've got that with me. I had done, I'm hiding behind a pine tree. I, I bounce off the ground. I've done grab my orange hat. I've ripped it off, and I've shoved it down in my jacket, and I unsnapped the, the catch on that pistol, and I'm hiding behind this big tree, and I'm looking around, peeping around, and I've got this rifle up, and I've done flip the safety off, and I've just got my finger straight. And I'm watching all this stuff, these trees and all this crap will flop back and forth, stuff falling. And I'm watching all this unfold. And in my mind, 
I'm fixing to be out. I'm I'm fixing to be the guy that's gonna have to try to kill one of these things, or it's gonna kill me. And I I didn't like being in that. That I, that was not where I wanted to be. I, I wanted to be some damn where else. And uh, yeah, there you go. You you could have went back later and snapped pictures of all this stuff. How long did it take you to go back in the woods after this? How long did it take you to talk yourself back into going back in the woods? It was, over, it was over. It was over two weeks before I could go back in the woods. I, I mean, I, I didn't care. I, I got home. I didn't want to do nothing. I didn't want to do anything. I mean, it's like this damn thing's going to kill me or I'm going to kill it or we're going to kill each other mutually. Um, I mean, what am I going to do? Go take pictures of a broke tree. That That's not going to do anybody any good. I mean, they, I see all kinds of pictures. I hear people take. Don't do any good. I mean, what am I going to tell you? There's a broke tree limb. I lived through it. I know what it was. I mean, it, that's, uh, if, if you've never been traumatized by these things, I mean, I've been, I've been law enforcement 16, right at 16 years. I've been shot at, had people draw knives. We rolled around in the mud, the blood and the beer and had to put people in cuffs. High speed chases, felony warrants, drug raids. I've done a lot of it, lots of it. I have never had to fear any of that that I had right over here in these woods about a mile and a quarter from where I'm sitting right now. Um, like I said, my buddy was with me. When this thing, by the time by the time this thing quit screaming, the motorcycle quit revving up. This, the last time the motorcycle revved up and this thing answered back to the motorcycle, I never heard it leave. I didn't hear it come in to start with. But when that thing left, I didn't hear it. It was, it was a break in it. It got quiet, and I'm just sitting there, just a nervous wreck, and I'm waiting to figure out what's going on. The motorcycle revs up the last time, and when this thing answered that motorcycle, it had to be five, 400 to 500 yards toward the motorcycle like it left me going that way. I never heard it leave, but I had a ungodly sigh of relief that this thing has got some distance, and now is my chance to leave. Dude, I flip my safety back on and I come around that pine and I go across as quiet as I can. I'm like, I'm tippy toes sneaking across and I get to the, where the, the timber changed and it was just an old log road and a lot of pine straw in it. And I'm going out through there and my buddy, he'd come out of that stand and he had to make this big loop several hundred yards to get around this thicket to get to where I'm at. And when I pop out of the pine timber, a couple of hundred yards from where I was originally, when I get there and there's a forestry service road had big rock about big as my fist, big gray rock in it. I look and I see my buddy. He's, he's got his orange hat on. I had an ultimate sigh of relief and he looks at me and he's like, are you okay? I couldn't even really, I couldn't even talk to him to start with. No, yeah. And then it was, and then it was about another hundred or so yards down to my truck. We get to my pickup and he, he still, are, are you okay? I said, I will be just give me a minute. I opened my truck door open the door on the driver's side and my buddy's going, do I need to drive? I said, no, I'll be all right. Just give me a minute. I took my rifle, put the barrel down by the brake pedal and laid the, the stock up in the seat. And I stand there and hold the steering wheel with a hand. I'm standing on the ground and I grabbed the door. And I had such an adrenaline dump that I bowed up and heaved and puked. And I puked two or three times. I mean, it made me severely nauseated. I just threw up and then threw up. I'm, I'm wiping my face and my buddy's like, are you all right? He said, can you drive? Yeah, I, I can drive. Just get in. We, we need to go. And uh, that, I mean, that's people that's never been through this. have no clue. They've got no clue. I have people all the time. Man, I wish I could see one. I wish I could see one. I wish everybody could see one, but I don't wish some of the things that I've went through on anybody. I, I, I do not. Um, I've, I've dealt with these things for years and years and years since around 2000. So we about 24 years deep into this, uh, hundreds and hundreds of encounters. I mean, I've had them follow me out. Some of it was benign. Some of it was basically no ill will with them. And then sometimes they were madder than hell that we were there and they wanted us to leave and we knew it and we always left. Um, I mean, I, I've seen tree limbs, that big round, way bigger than my forearm, four foot long, L shaped. You can hear it clipping tree limbs, and that thing come flying, go fifty or sixty yards out in the green field, and go bouncing across the field. 
I've been in a tree stand. Be small pine timber around me, about 12, 14 foot high, and I'm, say, 16 foot off the ground, so I can kind of see over it, like looking over a cornfield. I can hear these things coming. And not only can I hear where they're at, breaking limbs coming through that thicket, I can see the tops of the trees part and they spring back up. And you could hear them coming around and the trees would part. It was like he was watching a fish swimming through the water, like close to the top mm -hmm, mm -hmm. behind it. But I'm watching it come around the thicket. I mean, I, I've had them walk up within 30, 40, 50 feet of my stand, sit there and huff at me, grunt and growl at me. They'd come in and then they'd sit there and just draw it up. You don't know what to do. You don't know whether to, you, you damn sure don't want to try to get down when you know it's right here. Cause I, you're compromised when you start trying to come down that ladder. So what do you do? You have to sit there and wait it out. And hopefully it gives you a little bit of a break, a little buffer zone where you feel confident enough to come down. And I've come down, went to the truck. They'd follow me out. They, they'd come back walking and you, you'd walk, they'd walk. You stop and they'd stop. I'd make it to the truck. May huff at you a little bit. They may growl a couple of times, but I've also done the same thing. Been in the stand and walk around. Then they'd leave and it sound like they went 200 yards and they'd go out of, out of here and you think, well, they're gone. He's gone. I give him a few more minutes. I'm going to sneak down. Then I'm going to go to the truck. Climb all the way down that stand. And the very second that my foot hit a dry leaf, as soon as that leaf crunched, it sounded like a whole world exploded 200 yards away. And through that thicket, it sounds like a train derailing or a car wrecking. I mean, you're, you're hearing something that it sounds like, like you was talking about a while ago, like a Brahma bull that's running wide open, crashing through this thicket, coming straight to where I'm standing. And I whirl and run out in the field. By the time I run, say, 30, 40 yards, this thing's come 200 through this thicket crashing. And when I whirl and level my rifle down, thinking I'm fixing to have to shoot this thing, flip the safety and my fingers by the trigger, the thing, as soon as that rifle came up, the thing stopped. I'm talking about just like slammed on brakes. Yeah. It don't come plumb out in the field. It's still 25 feet kind of in the dark underbrush. I can see the, the limbs moving because it's, it's going and it's walking. Guess what it's doing? It's it ran exactly to the tree, to the tree that my stand was on, ran straight to it. And this thing is walking back and forth, pacing, and it's grumbling and growling and huffing. And then it starts. I could feel the ground as this thing's running through that thicket. When its feet would hit the ground, I could feel the ground shake under my feet. I could feel the vibration of it pounding the ground, and it ran to me. This thing's going back and forth, and it's breaking limbs, and it's huffing and growling and grumbling, and just it's mad as hell. And I'm standing there with a the damn rifle. Hoping and praying, I'm not fixing to have to kill this thing. And I'm looking around, heads on a swivel, and I'm backing up, backing up, going out in the field and getting further away from it, trying to trying to make sure that, that this one's got my attention, that there's not one I'm backing to. Absolutely, yeah. And as I back away and back away a little further, this thing's over there. And I'll, in my mind, I can't tell you what it was doing, but it sa absolutely sounded like what you would see King Kong on a movie beating its chest. Yeah, I absolutely. I'm like, blah, 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 blah. And it's going, and it's just back and forth and back and forth. And I keep backing across the field and back across the field. Well, next thing I know, it dawns on me about the time I'm fixing to be at my road going back to my truck, which is about 200 yards. This thing ain't right there in that one spot anymore. It's circling the damn field. It don't want to come out where I can see it. It's going around the field. And as soon as Thank I got, you. as soon as I got in that that path going out, I threw my rifle back, or actually sucked it in like this, and I broke running. Well, over my shoulder, I can hear this thing coming, chasing me around that. It ran around that field, about a two acre field. It ran around it, and it's going. I'm going this way, and it's gaining, coming in at an angle. And when I got to my truck, that damn thing was within forty feet of me in the thicket. It done caught me. And it plows. Yeah, you, you, can, you can't outrun that. I tell people all the time, don't try to outrun them. You're not going to outrun them. You got to stay in your ground and you got to, you just got to wait it out and see what's going to happen. Because most times, uh, at least the ones that I deal with, will give you an out. They will give you a way to get away, to get away so that you don't get hurt. They don't get hurt. Nobody else comes back looking for them, but they will. 
you know, people don't understand when these things scream at you, okay? And they could be 100 yards away from you. But when they scream at you, every ounce of fluid in your body vibrates. It just vibrates. You've never felt any. I, I, I always tell people, yeah, go to a Metallica concert and stand next to the PA that's attached to the, the bass drum. And that's what you're going to feel. Something like that. Because every fiber of your being vibrates. And it's your brain can't comprehend what's going on because you know it's it's across on the other side of the lake on top of the ridge but yet you're feeling this like it's standing right in front of you could you imagine what it feels like you know in front of them 25 feet in front of them wow i can, I can tell you this i've been the, the closest railroad tracks to where i live is about 25 miles and it comes through the middle of a town here in north alabama i've been up there in a train coming through town and maybe 50 or so feet from the railroad track. That CSX railroad guy lays down on that train horn and that train horn would not vibrate through me like that booger did right over here in these woods. Absolutely not. I agree. Yeah. These people out here, I know that's going to sound crazy, but you tell me what, <laughs> kind of, what kind of blood and bone creature do you know of? They can scream louder than a train horn can blow. <laughs> I've heard it right here many times. Uh, I think it's interesting that Al said they will leave you a way out. Uh, you know, as if to say, again, a lot of this stuff is just to push you out, to get you out of where you're at in their area or whatnot. And they're like, hey, get and they leave you an opening to get that seems to be a lot of people's experiences too you know there's yeah, a way they, out and they can be triangulating you because they do triangulate they'll they'll be three of them you know what i mean but they'll people people don't like to go the way they're driving you out where they i always call it hurting the way they heard you, a lot of people are afraid to go that way because they think they're being led into a, a, an ambush but the truth of the matter is, every time that's happened to me, I'm being given a path out to safety. You know what I mean? I've never come across an ambush yet. You know, I'm still here. Everyone I've ever taken out over the years, we're all still here. No, but no one has ever been injured. Yeah, we have. We had rocks thrown at us. Yeah, but we've never been hit. You know, um, have we had? Like you said, trees flung over our heads. Yeah, but we've never been hit. Like I said, the last one where we where they were working their way up. I think the time with the women when they came charging out of the darkness. It's like one was like a hundred yards away from us, and one there were one on either side of us. And the, when this one came charging out of the darkness up to us, the other two jumped on. It was a, it was actually a mining road. And they started doing the monkey barking, hoo, 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 hoo. and the woods is echoing, and it's getting louder and louder. And to me, uh, originally, I felt like they were trying to scare the shit out of the women that I was with, okay? And the women took off running, even though I told them, don't run, you can't outrun them. The women took off running. And I had to stop them from running. You know, I had to, they got about you know 50 yards away. I caught up to them. I said, stop running. And then they started jumping up and down and started slapping the mining road. And the vibration is coming down the road at 100 yards and going up your legs and through your body in there. And they're working their way up to a frenzy. And I'm thinking, okay, it's past the point of just scaring the shit out of the women. Now they're working their way up. I have to do something quick. Because I have to nip this in the bud, otherwise they may be they may come charging down, right? I don't know what their intention is. Because again, I don't believe these are the adults; these are the the teenagers. Sir. So I'm thinking, okay, I can pull out my flare gun, shoot it up into the air, but it's the fall and may set the woods on fire when it lands. I don't want to do that. Um, I could. I had all these thoughts go through my mind, like a million miles. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I said, okay, the only thing I had on me that night was an 18-inch machete and a 10-inch survival knife. So I pulled out the machete, 
I put on the headlamp and I had a good, nice headlamp that went like, you know, 700 feet or so. I put the machete in the headlamp so they could see that metal shining. And I started walking right towards all three of them. And the minute I started walking towards them, I started screaming and cursing at them. Like they could understand every word I said. And the women were freaking out because I'm getting further away from them. And they're like, Al, please stop. You're getting too far away from us. And I'm like, no, I, I wanted to get eyes on what I was dealing with. And I kept walking. But every time I took a step closer to them, they took a step back. And I could never get them into the headlamp. When I finally reached the point of where they were, which was at the mouth of the lake, right at the beginning of the lake, they must have turned and ran because they were gone. They were nowhere to be found. But when I tell you the woods, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, if I can hear this, these woods, it just sounds like a million gorillas are in the woods, you know? If I can hear this, so can the big guys up at the home site, the camp, you know, their home range. And they're going to want to know what the hell is going on that the woods, you know, so much noise. Because when the big ones came down around us, they came down like a herd of elephants. Boom, boom, boom. And they surrounded us. And you could feel the ground vibrate. as they, And they did it on purpose. They wanted to let the women know that we were surrounded, you know. And the women freaked out. And they were like, you know, we're surrounded. I was like, don't worry about it. When they want us to go. And they started throwing little pebbles at us. But we had um, glow sticks around us. None of the pebbles came in to the little rocks came inside the, the circle of the glow sticks. Everything landed on the outside. But when that one, you know, and every, 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 I felt the women's anxiety raising. And I kept telling them, look, if I can feel your anxiety, they can feel your anxiety. And we don't want to, we don't want to make them anxious. You know what I mean? So you guys have to chill out. Everything is under the control where nothing bad has ever happened here. Relax. And then when that one broke that branch, it's like a 30 out of six. Okay, okay. Now it's time to leave. <laughs> that was, that was the, that was the key moment at that point where like, okay, we want to hunt. You're in the way you have to go. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But they sent the juveniles to hurt us out. And we knew that we knew they were on either side of us. We knew they were behind us because they were all communicating, whooping or sounding like barn owls or whatever they were whistling. They were whistling. And we knew it wasn't barn owls. And we knew it wasn't other animals whistling in the woods. We knew it was going on around us, you know. But I told them, we're going to walk out of here at our own pace. No one's going to scare us out of here. We're going to leave. We're, gonna, we're not going to run out of here. And then when they came charging up, of course, it's scared to shit because you could just film the 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 the, the which we call the the mining road, which was cement, just vibrate like you know what I mean. And just and they just the women just took off running, and I stopped and I turned and I faced them, and I was like, "No, we're not going to do this tonight," you know. And uh, when it, whenever you took them out there, like, was this an area? that you knew about and you took them out there because you were looking for boogers. Like you knew that this area had boogers and you were trying to draw them in. You had yeah, this was, this was, this was my, what I call the sacred site. And I've been dealing with this particular clan for years and years and years. And we, we gift back and forth and, you know, they know me. I, we have, a, we have a deal. Their home range is above the western, on the other side of the western ridge. I won't go up over that western ridge. That's my deal to them. I'll stay on, I'll stay on the east side of the ridge, and they can do whatever they want on that side of the ridge. I'm not going over. But every time I'm at the sacred site, they know I'm there, and they come down to see who's there. You know? Do you, can you take like recorders and video, all that stuff, or do you never take that with you? No, I, take it, I take all kinds of stuff with me, yeah. So did you have recorders and video going? That night? Um, I'm sure I am sure I had a, a, a recorders and video going. I usually do. I usually set up at least two digital voice recorders, and 
I usually have at least three cameras going, full spectrum, thermal, and um, infrared, you know? So I usually have stuff going, but, um, you know, I don't care about the audio anymore, and I don't care about the images anymore. I'm so pissed at everything I do now. I do like 250 environmental readings every time I go out. And every time I do something to change the environment, I take all the readings over again to see how the readings change. I have three rituals that I do that ch changes the environment or draws them in. You know what I mean? Yeah. It all depends on what I'm, I'm trying to, but every time I do something to change the environment, every time I do a ritual, I'll do a baseline, right? When I first get there, I'll do 250 readings, see what everything is like. And then I'll do a ritual, whether it's a, an incense ritual, a Native American drum ritual, or a frequency. There's a frequency that I like to use. I think you know about it. Um, I don't talk too much yeah. about it. And a freak, and they they usually brings them in, you know, one or the other, depending on what time of the year it is. And then as soon as I, every time I do a ritual, I go through all the readings again to see how, what changes in the readings. And everything always changes. Have, have you found anything specific that like changes the readings or whatever? Uh, that, that I'm not 1000% on what you're talking about with the readings, like what you can look at to, to get a measurement of the area. But have you found anything that you do specifically that like changes the, the energy, the vibration, anything like that? Everything I do changes, changes some, some, something <laughs> in the readings. They're all, like I said, between the 250 different readings I do, everything I do changes something in the readings. You know what I mean? I'm not going to be specific whether it's EMF or, uh, you know, radiation readings or, you know, R, R, uh, was it? What's Chris is big on the R, the RS, RF, or the RF yeah. readings, you know, yeah. something always changes, but I'm so far beyond those simple things. You know what I mean? I've been doing those things since day one because I started as a ghost hunter and I always, that was the equipment I had. So that was the equipment I worked with. I worked with my, my ghost hunting equipment on every aspect of the paranormal, whether it's cryptids, UFOs, or ghosts. You know what I mean? Because that's the equipment I had. And, and it all works for every field. Yes, it does. Absolutely. Yes, it does. You know it. And uh, again, it's frequency, vibration, uh, intention. Yes, sir. And uh, what was it? Frequency, vibration, consciousness, and intention. Those are the four things. I was told I had a, what I like to call uh, an awakening, okay, a spiritual awakening. And I was told the secrets of the virus, of the universe, and it was frequency, consciousness, and vibration. I always like to throw in intention as well because intention is really big here in our in our realm. It really creates a lot of a lot of. Uh, things that happen is our intentions you know you go into the int into the woods with an intent of doing something trying to outsmart these things or try to capture one you're never gonna you're never you may not come back out of the woods you know what i mean but if you go in with good intention you know you'll have a great experience so so you think that they can read that that they can pick up on that i i'm not arguing hell i've seen deer that i think can zone in on you because you're so intent on killing them yeah what there's a what there's that what you, that that um connection again that um yeah, energy I signature agree. you know what what do you think these things are what do you think that boogers are we won't get into all the other stuff but just boogers what do you what do you think that bigfoot is i think it's some kind of human hominid with it that's been around for thousands of years that has developed its frequencies and vibrations to a higher level that they can do 
metaphysical things with their minds because they've just been here for thousands of years. They've just evolved that way. Um, I do believe when they're here, they're flesh and blood and they can be killed. There's no doubt in my mind about that. But I also, I've experienced them going four miles where, where we're at. We were at the north end of this 52 it's 52 acre lake. I'm at the north end of this 52 acre lake, and it's a three, four mile hike just to get to that northern end. And I've experienced them go from the north end to the south end in a thousand of a second. How do you whoop here, right behind me, and then whoop at the the mouth of the lake that's three and a half miles away in a, in a second? How do you do that? You. You don't think it could just be more than one of them? I've experienced more than one of them on several occasions where they've come in from the north and the south and the east. But the one that whooped behind us that night and the one that whooped originally at the south end of the lake, two different tones. When this one whooped here and the one at the south end of the lake whooped, two different tones. And then he whooped again. And then he whooped again a second later, and he was at the same tone. You know, I mean, I know they can mimic all kinds of animals and vehicles and everything else. And could they mim mimic each other? Probably. But the vibe I got, and again, it's gut feeling. It's just one man's opinion. It was the same one that was directly behind us because we never heard a leaf. We heard it come in. We heard it come in. We heard it with the parabolic mic walk up to us. We heard it without the parabolic mic when it whooped at us three times. We heard it when it picked up a rock the size of a bowling ball and threw it 150 feet over the tree, landed between three guys sitting in a circle. And we, we but we never heard it walk away. Yeah. And the next thing we know, it's three and a half miles away at the south end of the lake. And, you know, you have three seasoned investigators looking at each other like, what the hell just happened? What right. the hell, what did we just experience? You know, I mean, it's, it's my, the more you're out there with them, the more you experience. Look, I've started, when I first started off, I was a flesh and blood guy, especially at 12 years old, when I seen that monster <laughs> kill that Brahma bull, flesh and blood, you couldn't convince me otherwise. But the longer you're out there and the more metaphysical or paranormal stuff you experience, you just, it, and nothing else can answer that question. How do they do, how do they do this? You hear them come in, you don't hear them leave, you know? Then you do, when you do hear them leave, they're three miles away. It's, it's just, bless it's mind-boggling. God bless. Thank you. <laughs> it's mind boggling. It's just the stuff that you experience when you're out there. It's just the more you're out there and the more you research them, the more stuff you'll. That's why, like I said, I don't care about that million dollar photo. I don't, or the video, or the howls, or the whoops. I don't care about any of that stuff anymore. <laughs> All I care about is the environmental readings. Because when any, whenever anything comes into our environment, and I mean anything in the universe. It has a, a, a signature, an energy signature. And if you're working with the right piece of equipment, you're going to pick up what that signature is, you know? And when you can learn the difference between all these different signatures, then you can start putting names to what you're dealing with. That's just, I know, that's, I know I sound crazy, but that's just where I am. In my no, research. no, I agree with every bit of it, and that's exactly <laughs> what happened to us. You, you, you could tell that there were certain ones coming in from certain directions, and just getting close like that, just out of nowhere. Just one call, they was a hundred yards back. The next time they called, after they called to this one over here, that was fifty yards away. This one was forty yards away, and you never even heard it move. No, I mean they, they. I've had them. I've I've been up at the sacred site. I got a quick story. I'm up there with a friend of mine who is a he belongs to an alphabet agency. Okay. And he's like, Al, take me out. I want to I want to experience these things. I said, okay, but you can't bring your gun. 
I don't want any, I don't want you coming in with your gun because it may just give them a bad vibe, you know? And he's got these night vision goggles, you know, whatever generation they were, they're government issued, okay? And we're sitting at the sacred site, just me and him. And they come in off the ridge. And you can hear them come in off the ridge. They want you to know they're coming in. Boom, 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 like a herd of elephants. And then he pulls up. I'm sitting with my back to the, I'm facing south. He's facing north. He pulls up the same facing goggles and he sees one standing about 50 feet behind me. And he pulls them down and he goes, Al, there's the one right behind you, 50 feet behind you. And I'm like, all right, don't worry about it. This is the sacred site. There's nothing but calm, relaxed energy here. Nothing's going to happen to us here. Pulls up the goggles again. He's Al, it's like 20 feet behind you. Don't worry about it. Pulls him up a third time. And it's belly crawling up to me, literally belly crawling up to me. And it's like seven feet away from me. And he's like, dude, there's one like seven feet away from me. He's like, this thing is going to reach out and grab you. And I said, no, it's not. And I try to do like this casual stretching motion, right? Like I'm getting up to stretch. In the meantime, I'm trying to turn my cameras around so I can get it on one of my cameras. By the time I, I, I got up and turned that camera around, I remember which camera I was grabbing, but they were all filming and it was gone. Oh, it was gone. He said, he said, he watched it jump up, take off. And in a split second, it was gone. He said, it just like went so fast, but we didn't hear it run through the woods. We didn't hear it take down any trees. Like it was like a bulldozer. It's just boom, gone, just gone. And he was freaking out. He was like, dude, you are insane, you know? And I was like, no, nah, this is the sacred site. Don't worry about it. He ended yeah. up getting hit with um, infrasound that night because he didn't listen to me. We went to another site where I got my dislocated shoulder, right? I wanted to show him the swamp where I got the, where they're killing all the guys. And we, I was being pulled off the main trail. And I got about 50 yards into this thick of woods and I got a really bad vibe and I said okay we have to stop we have to go now somebody on my team had a remote view this remote view the night for us and he said at some point you're going to see a blue flash I don't know what it means but you can see a blue flash okay whatever that means right and you take it with a grain of salt we go into this thicket I get a bad vibe and I say okay stop we have to leave. I feel like we're going into somebody's home territory. It's not my clan. It's a different clan, and we're not supposed to be here. So I start to walk out, but he doesn't listen to me. He's going in deeper and deeper, and I'm telling him, dude, you have to stop because at some point I'm going to lose eyes on you, and then you may disappear forever, and I don't want to be the one to tell your wife. You know, you have to stop. So I leave, I get back on the main trail. There's an Appalachian trail on the Appalachian trail. He finally, he gets a bad vibe and he comes out. He hears like a, mean, a grunt, right? He comes running out of there and he's like, dude, I heard this grunt. Two seconds later, he's facing me. I'm facing, he's facing south. I'm facing north. I see a blue flash go off, like an old fashioned light bulb. Remember the ones with the four bulbs that would spin around? All right. And I see this blue flash, and he goes down. He gets hit with some kind of infrasound. He drops, falls right into my arms. I catch him. I put him up against the tree. So what happened? He said, I don't know. I just felt like I got hit with an energy wave or something. So I said, all right, take your time. I gave him some water, put some water over his head because he was sweating profusely. He was nausea. He had nausea. He was weak. He just didn't feel good. I was like, dude, I'm going to have to carry this dude out. We're like two miles in, you know, and he got back up on his feet and we walked. And I told him, I said, look, you get home and you're pissing blood, go to the emergency room because you got hit with infrasound tonight because you didn't listen. And that was the last time I ever took him out because he didn't listen to me. I was like, okay, you know what? I can't trust you anymore. So you can't come out with me anymore. Well, you know, now was that, was that, Infrasound for me or for him? I'm going to say it was for him because 
I left when I got that vibe to leave and he pushed it. He pushed the envelope a little bit, you know, and uh, they gave, they hit him with that emphasis. And I seen that blue flash, boom, come out of the darkness. It's just crazy. And he went down like somebody hit him with a baseball bat in the back of the head. I seen blue and red when I'd close my eyes when it happened to me at Greg's. You seen blue and red? Yeah. I don't want no part of any blue or red light or anything like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, you, you know, that's like you was talking about. Um, you wonder if maybe they see the auras or whatever. I have to agree on that because I think, and I tell them all the time, depending on your attitude, your energy you're putting out, it, it, that makes a huge difference in the kind of reaction you get when you're out doing this kind of thing. You um, know, they, they know. Yeah. It's an energy signature. It really is. That's what it comes down to it. Everything, everything in the universe has an energy signature, everything. That's how my psychic can tell from Arkansas what I'm dealing with in the woods, whether it's cryptid, spiritual, um, interdimensional, alien, whatever it is. It's because she's been around so long and she's been doing this her whole life. And again, third generation. She knows. She's been taught by her grandmother, her great-grandmother, what all these energy signatures are. And she knows. She knows what she's dealing with, you know? And and it's all because she she know she knows what that she feels that energy signature. She knows immediately what she's dealing with. Okay, this is um uh, what do they call it? Elemental. This is an elemental. Boom. She knows. You know, she just knows. Yeah. I got a message. I can't say who it is because he probably doesn't want me to. But we all know him very well, uh, you included. And he sent me a message after one of the shows um, we done one day, and he said, "I, you know, I don't really." know how to say this or don't want you to think I'm like crazy or whatever he said, but I seen your aura in this show that you was doing. And I don't even remember what I was talking about. And he said, it looked like a rainbow and had white, uh, you know, around it too. And he said that a psychic friend of his actually, he sent her a clip of the video and said, you know, do you, do, do you see anything that, I'm thinking I'm seeing, but you just tell me what you see. And she said, I see a rainbow of uh, different color around her with white. And she said, that's really rare. Um, and he, when he told me that, I mean, it just kind of, which everybody's changes, you know, let the mood you're in or whatever, your aura will change colors depending on how you're feeling. If you're sick, if you're happy, sad, mad, whatever. But to have somebody tell me that, you know, there was so much color to it. I mean, maybe that's why they're so drawn to certain people. Um, just all the different kinds of energy you've got going all at once. Yeah, and if you, if you see one that has white on the inside and white on the outside, that's like frequency level. It's just like off the charts. You know what I mean? Those are so rare. Usually either the whites on the inside or the whites on the outside. But if you see one with two, woo, forget about it. You're dealing with somebody from another level. You know what I mean? I'm trying to find somebody who does um, uh, aura photography so I could actually get a photo of I all the people I know. And I know a zillion people. I can't find one that does aura photography. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. It was rumored that that got outlawed. Do you know anything about yeah. that? Been yeah. told really? The yes. The chemical the, photography was outlawed in the United States. The chemical oh, for the Calarian photography, the chemicals used to process that is you can't buy them anymore. That's like that uh, dye. What do you call it? Dicayani or di dicayani or whatever that dye that they did for the the very first generation of night vision goggles where yeah. where everybody was seeing the demons and everything that that <laughs> one element that one compound that di 
Kyani, Dikyani, whatever. That's like you can't get that without a government clearance now. Oh wow! Same, I didn't know. I didn't know anything that. Yeah. No wonder but, why I can't well, find somebody. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're going to keep it away from me any way they can. Yeah. Well, I, that's the job of the government at this point. Everybody's got to start like saying, hey, why? Uh, we are over two hours into this, guys. If anybody has any questions for Al, throw them up pretty please uh, real quick. And Squirrel, Greg, you got any like last questions for Al or anything? Uh, Miss Diane, I think she may have had to go. I'm not sure, but she wanted to know if Al would tell one of his good paranormal stories. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't even know where to start. You know what I mean? I have so many paranormal experiences. Yeah, we're, honestly, I, thank you, Diane, but I really wouldn't know where to start. I mean, if she if she had one in particular she wanted to hear, I would definitely I would definitely say it, but I just don't know where to go with that. You know. Mm. Another show, please. <laughs> uh, well, we can get him back on. I he's agree. Got, sure. right? He's got way more stuff to talk about. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, any any time, what you guys got to do is ask. Oh, that's Cat. I love this woman right here. Uh, Cat Heart. Cat uh, yep. Ward for Paranormal Heart. She's she's a she's like um. My sister, I love her to death, but um, yeah, anytime you guys want me, you just, you know, ask and I'll, I'll be more than happy to come on, you know, um, we could take it in a different direction next time. You know, it doesn't have to be, um, I, well, I know you want to, you want to, I know you want to go down the dog man road. I know you do. No, it's not he, that you know, I want to. He wouldn't even <laughs> talk about to. dog man, <laughs> paranormal, anything. We're, we're finally starting to get him out of his shell a little bit. <laughs> I will, I will admit, no, I still don't like talking about it. <laughs> I will admit that, that specifically Misty has rubbed off on me a lot on the paranormal. And people I rub you. <laughs> <laughs> you know that's not what look bitch that is not uh, what i said but anyway oh uh, you're too funny uh, oh don't get her going out she gets she gets oh, way worse Josh, i love you i'm kidding <laughs> please oh. yes if anybody oh i gotta make a uh specific announcement just so everybody knows a couple things really uh number one first of all chad if you end up seeing this show, thank you so much for talking to me this weekend. And I've spoken to a couple people, but uh, I really want to get that guy to record his stuff, be on the show, be on our show, somebody else's show. He needs to get his stuff out there. And y'all, if you just want to talk to somebody, even if you don't want to do a YouTube show. Mm -hmm. You can email us and get in touch with us. I'll give you my phone number. I'll talk to you. I'll put you in contact with whoever you want. Greg, Squirrel, whatever, anybody, you know. And if you just want to get off your chest and talk about it, if you don't want to do a YouTube show, that's perfectly fine, guys. We hear this stuff from a lot of people. I just want to make sure that that's very clear. If you want to talk to somebody, let us know. But please email us. And even if you've just got little bitty stuff where you think like it's not a uh, thank you, Kat. Uh, if you think it's not like a, a great massive experience or whatnot, we don't care. We don't care. We've all had stuff where it's like, I don't even know if that was anything, but it was weird or it was strange, you know, and, and we're open minded to everything. I mean, we'll just let you talk. But anyway, please contact us. Also, the uh, the meet and greet, at this point, we've got, if everybody shows up, it's going to be about 120 plus people, and that's probably not including some of the More ones that. that are in That's probably not including some of the people that are staying not there in the group campground that we have, so I don't know, but if you haven't actually gone on the Woodwalkers Facebook page, and signed up to say that you're coming. 
Now, a couple of y'all have emailed me or messaged me uh, privately and just said, hey, I'm coming. I went ahead and put y'all in there. But for anybody that is just now hearing this, if you have not planned to come, if you show up, there might be room. It's a pretty big campground. There might not be. There are other campgrounds right there nearby. So you can stay at one of them. The private campground is paid for. If you have to stay at one of the other ones, you're going to have to get a pass uh, to pay for it to stay there or whatnot. We are going to have a ton of people at this thing as it stands. If everybody shows up, that's just crazy. I'm going to try to mark out a spot for parking too, because we're going to have some people that's wanting just to come up for the day and yeah. hang out. And that way we can make yeah. sure that we've got enough parking for everybody and not blocking the roads. Yeah. What? We probably have enough room for people to like park and just walk in and everything, but you might have to park a ways away and walk in. Still be inside that campground area, but like park right where you get into where it opens up and then walk a ways. I mean, I don't know what to do. 120 some people, if not more, coming. I mean, that's a lot of people to fill up that campground. But we, we can handle it. There ain't no need. I, I'm not afraid at all. We're going to have a ball. <laughs> Greg ain't worried. Greg ain't walking nowhere. Greg's going to drive. <laughs> up. I'm going to roll my little wheelchair right up in the crowd. Sure. I'm going to get some mud grips on this wheelchair. <laughs> I'll bring Spencer's backpack and we'll carry you around. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you Apollo just got to bring that shit up. <laughs> Al, thank you very much. This was great. Um, I really thank, appreciate it. Thank you. Yes. Al, thank Spencer, you. Spencer, thank you. Bye. Missy, thank you. Greg, get better. As as a guy with two um, titanium knees, I feel your pain. So, uh, well, like the bionic man, you know what I mean. So, slowly but surely, uh, it'll it'll get better. Just give it time, brother. Yeah. And thank you, thank you, everybody for having me. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you. No, man. Hey, thank you. We'll get you back on, and we'll go over some of the other stuff. I mean, you you could probably do five shows on your own now. So. <laughs> A lot of stuff. Yeah. Lifetime worth of stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. I just hope, I just hope that great. I hope some of our subscribers that, that wasn't aware of who Al was or whatever, y'all jump over and check out his months and subscribe to his stuff. So share the love. Yeah, all the links are in the description. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank yeah. you. Everybody else that we support, you know, the list, whatever, go check all them out. And, uh, Anyway, we'll catch y'all next week, right? Thank you, guys. Later, Thanks, folks. moderators. Appreciate you. Yes. Thank Good night. You. Bye, y'all. Bye, y'all. Squirrel. <laughs> hey, y'all. Hey, Spencer. We're swapped Hello. around. Huh? We're swapped around again. Yep, but I know you do it on purpose.